it's amazing that I still get nervous standing in here in front of all of you that I've been standing on a stool with my dad I couldn't even see over the pulpit and I'm still shaking and I'm sweating I don't get it sometimes but and it's been that way since I got up <laughs> so I I think Mike and I both heard this song on the same day and it said something to both of us because he came to me and said listen to this song I heard this song and I said oh yeah I heard that earlier today it's more of a prayer and the name of the song is Let Them See You. But I know in my daily life that that's something that when I'm surrounded by people that I know are not in church, that are not saved, I want to be sure that they see Christ in my life every day, no matter what. And I know I fail at that, just like everybody else does, but it's always a prayer for me that they can see Christ in me. So y'all listen to the words and just pray for me as I sing this. this morning. Brian, the auxiliary. Is it on mute? Hey, is the CD player on? Okay, really? <laughs> it worked fine this morning, didn't it, Miss Deb? I don't think I can do this one a cappella. I know, it's okay. By the time you get done, I won't have any left. <laughs> It'll be gone by then. Jesus is patient. Right, yeah. Is it your iPad plugged up? <laughs> no, it didn't. I don't know. <sighs> Do what? <laughs>
there, you're not the only one that sweats and and gets nervous. I get nervous when technology doesn't work, whenever I lo- leave my notes behind or something like that. So I know how that all feels. Uh, I want to talk to you about marriage because you're all thinking about love, I know, because guys, you've already got your Valentine's gift for the ladies already, and ladies, you've already got it for the men. And uh, I want to take this opportunity, since we're already thinking about our relationships and uh, about gifts, about giving to our, our spouses, that we would take this time to hone in and look at marriage. And what is marriage? Uh, and I know that not everyone in here is married, okay? We got some young teenagers over here that are not married, but you know what? One day you will probably be married. And hey, you want to know what a good wi- you want to know what a good wife, a good husband looks like? We're going to be going through that. And those of you who are married, this is an opportunity for you to work and to enrich your marriage. Uh, for those of you who are widowed, uh, under- I understand that you're not married right now, but you can echo these truths to the men and ladies around you that these things are true, that you can teach the younger that these things are, are correct. And uh, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 5 primarily, Ephesians chapter 5. But what I want us to get out of this, more than anything, is that we would all have healthy families. Why is that so important? Why should we all have healthy families? Because I believe that the church is made up of families. And if the families in the church are healthy, the church is therefore healthy. And so I want us to look together. And guys, as we're going through this, and guys, we're primarily going to hit on you guys this time, that we would look objectively and ask ourselves, how can I become the husband that God has called me out to become? Ladies, you get the day off. You'll get it in two weeks from now. But, and and I'm, I expect to hear a lot of amens from the ladies. Amen. All right, we're good. That's a good sound check. All right, what I want us to look at primarily is the husband in this role. And then two weeks from now, we'll look at the ladies. And then... Uh, Four week, uh, from, or three weeks from now, we will look at the cord that holds it all together. That's God and how we're to have our lives completely wrapped around him. And, the closer, and we'll learn the closer that we are to God, the closer we will be to each other as, as husband and wife. But right now, let's look at the husband. Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll look in verse 25. He says this, Husbands, love your wives. Ladies say, amen. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify, that is to set apart and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. I want us to look at three things with this. I want us to look at uh, what does loving your wife look like. And we're going to see that it's going to look like nourishment and cherishing. Because those are the two things that he tells us about how that Christ has loved the church. This is supposed to be a mirror image of how Christ loved the church. So, men, you ought to love your wife in the same way. And the very first thing I want you to notice about this love that God has had for his church is that this is a sacrificial love. This is a love that sacrifices. Now, How did Christ demonstrate this love? We hear it time and time again. Remember Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated. This was a demonstration, or God commendeth his love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get to where we were worthy of such a sacrifice, did he? It says, while we were the enemies of God, he still loved us. And I know some of you think your wife is your, your worst enemy. But you're still commanded to love her. And you're to demonstrate that love over and over again. But let me ask you this, men. When was the last time, and I'm I'm looking at this too because I am guilty of this. When was the last time you sacrificed for your wife? 
When was the last time that you set aside something that you wanted to do and exchanged it for something that she desired, that she wanted you to do? And when was the last time that, uh, as, you know, we, we come home from a hard day's work, we want to prop up our feet, my wife looks at me in just disgust because the dishes haven't been done? She doesn't do that, really. But I know she's thinking it. I know she's thinking it. But what you come in from a hard day's work, what is the thing? You want to just veg out, you want to just kick back, you want to just relax a little bit. But whenever she comes back, she comes in, she wants to do the same thing, doesn't she? Ladies, i got to hear an amen on that. Yeah, she wants to do the same thing. And so let me ask you, when was the last time you got off the couch, you got off the recliner, and you did something? Because the love that you ought to have should sacrifice. You should be looking to her needs and her desires above your own. That is the key to a successful marriage, guys. That is a key. Now, it's a shame, men, isn't it? It's a shame that our wives sometimes go without hearing or even knowing of our affection. You know, and, and we get so caught up in the idea, well, she knows I love her. She doesn't have to hear me say it. Let's just, let's just pretend for a, minute your, for a moment that your wife has a short-term memory. And I know that's, that's a stretch of the imagination because she remembers everything. <laughs> let's just think for a moment she has a short-term memory, okay? If you'll think about that, then you'll be in a constant state of reminder. Honey, honey I love you. I love you. I just want you to know that. Why is that so important? Because look at verse 28 and verse 29. It says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man yet hate his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even the Lord... Uh, the ch even as the Lord, the church. Let me say this. If you hate yourself, guys, I understand this. We are, our, we are critical, aren't we? That is our nature. We want to criticize everything, even ourselves. And we'll get to the point that we won't even love ourselves. Now, why is that so important that, that it says that the, the same relationship holds between you loving your wife and you loving yourself? Because think about this, if you hate you, then you're going to hate everything that likes you. Does that make sense? If A equals B and B equals C, A equals C, I'm going to pull some algebra on y'all. If you hate you, but she loves you, you can't understand why on earth someone would love you, and it's not a pious kind of thinking, it's a resentful kind of thinking. And you have to love you, and we're going to look at in a moment how that takes place. But Paul is trying to show you here that taking care of, just like you would take care of your physical body, you ought to see to and look to the needs and desires of your wife. And you need to take care of yourself. Uh, because you don't get another body, do you? You don't get another you. This is it. So what do you do? You take care of it. Now, um, can I put that to the same spin? Guys, you only get one wife. If you understood that the, that the person you married was the only person that you would ever get to marry, how would that sanctify the people that you're looking at in marrying young guys and girls? How would that set apart the people that you would marry? You wouldn't look for looks anymore because why? Looks fade away. Hey, I'm getting to be 30 and it's all starting to fade away, hair and all. It's all going away. It's all going to go away. Beauty is vain. You would look, therefore, to what? The inward person, right? You would look for the inner person and how that they, well, men, how that we'll look at for ladies next a uh, couple weeks from now, how that she would reverence you, how that she would respect you. And ladies, how that he would love you and do anything for you. But why, ought, why should you love your wife? Because it's for your own good. Amen? <laughs> uh, it's for your own good. Why, same, same concept. Why should you, therefore, eat? Because if you don't, you'll die, right? So understand that nourishment is for your own good. Eating is for your own good. 
loving your wife is for your own health. It's for your own good. It is a healthy thing. You, you see all the time men who have unhealthy marriages and, they, and their success at work, but they go home and they are miserable. It is, it, is, it, is, it is just a terrible sight because why? They have no relational health and it starts to plague on eventually their physical health, doesn't it? If you're always angry and resentful, do you not understand that that plays on your heart? Now, I'm not just talking about your spiritual heart, but your physical one as well. It plays on those physical attributes, and before long, it becomes unhealthy. And so you ought to love your wife, yes, for the spiritual benefit and the emotional benefit, but also because of the physical benefit that it's for your own good. Look at what it says and how that we should take care of her. I like it because it says it uses the word nourish, the word nourishment. For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even the Lord, the church. Nourishing her means far more than making sure she's got food on the table. Now, let me say this. Men, I believe that we ought to be the breadwinners. We bring home the bacon. You know, we, we are the breadwinners. We ought to be the ones that provide for our families. But this is speaking far more than her, uh, than her appetite for food. This is speaking, I believe, on her relational appetite. She has an appetite of hear, for hearing words that affirm her. Words that affirm her. She needs to hear she's smart. She needs to hear how lucky you are that you ever even got to marry her. She needs to hear how beautiful she is. And she needs to, she needs to hear how good her cooking is. There was once a pastor who went to this, fa this young couple who was having marital problems, and the wife fixed a casserole and uh, put it before the pastor, and the pastor ate it, and he said, Oh, this is so good. This is so wonderful. I can't believe you made this. It's amazing. And, you know, ten years later, you know, the marriage got back on the right track. They were doing just fine, and they invited the pastor back over to, uh, to eat with them, and she fixed that, that casserole he loved so much. And he takes a bite into it, and he doesn't say a word. And she's just perplexed by why he hasn't said anything, because he, she praised it, and he praised it last time. And she asked him, Mr. Pastor, do you not like the casserole? And he said, yes, it's great. He said, well, well, you said so much more about it back then. Did it get worse or something happened? And he said, no, it was so terrible, it needed all the praise it could get. But now it's good. <laughs> we need, they need to hear it from us. Guys, they, they, are, they are audio. That means they need to hear it from you. Don't ever take for granted that they know it. Don't ever take for granted uh, that you told it to her way back when. You need to tell it to her afresh every day. Because, here's, because, um, because they need to be affirmed and praise but our natural inclination isn't that right man is to criticize our wives to criticize now there was research that has found that in the first decade of marriage they discovered that couples that that stay together utter only five or few fewer put downs in every hundred comments that they make but they also found that Couples who inflicted twice as many verbal wounds, that is 10 or more put-downs out of every 100 comments, never make it. So if you were to do an inventory of all the things that you've said to your wife, out of all those things, how many of them were negative? Some of you, it was on the way over here, wasn't it? Ah, you're making us late every morning. Not saying anything about how beautiful it is, she is or how all the work that she put into, you know, making herself look pretty, we're just critical, man, we're late. We are late. I'm guilty of this. Probably was this morning. But you understand, if you, the couple that stays together, understand, man, you have a responsibility for the relational nourishment of your wife. And that begins in the conversations that you have and affirming her of her beauty, affirming of her of her intellect, how smart she is, 
And everything that she does, if there's a note of praise that needs to be sung to it, you need to, you need to, you need to just go ahead and belt on in and sing it out. Now, uh, men, we are in charge of our wives' perception of herself. Did you know that? We are in charge of her perception of herself, how she sees herself. Because how she sees herself is based upon the relationship she has with you. If everything's going good in the relationship, she'll have a positive outlook on herself. If everything's going bad and you're criticizing and you're putting her down, you know what's going to happen? She's going to start devaluing herself. And what will happen is this. The more we get critical, the more we don't feed her, her uh, appetite for relationship, if you do not affirm your wife, or if you fail to feed her in that appetite, she will be unhealthy and malnourished at best. And if it continues, she will seek out something or someone that will affirm her. It will happen. The greatest asset that any one of us have, man, and you better say amen to this, is our wives. It's not the car we drive, it's not the house we own, it's our wives. And we take care over, th we, we ought to take care of her above any possession that we possibly p possess. And that's why I like when uh, it says, um, the, next, the next one, first, you know, we, uh, we ought to love our wife, and how does that look? You nourish your wife, your wife has that relational appetite, and then the third thing is, you cherish your wife. You cherish your wife. That means you hold in high esteem and value that she is valuable. And when you, guys, when we have something that's valuable or we hold dear, we take care of it, don't we? Oh, some of you got a nice pickup truck out there. And some of you wash it, God bless you, every Saturday, and you put a, wax, a coat of wax on every month. You take care of that vehicle. You take care of of something that you cherish, don't you? And if you are to cherish your wife, you should put the same, at least the same, if not more, of the same energy and effort in the upkeep of your wife. And that takes time. That takes, as we looked at earlier, that takes sacrifice, doesn't it? To cherish your wife means to hold in high regard and esteem it and esteem her as valuable. What does it look like to cherish your wife? What does it look like, guys, when we cherish our wife? I know that, and I love how the, the book Every Man's Battle brings home this understanding about how that we need to have our eyes sanctified on our wife. That means that set apart. That means we don't look at anyone else. We don't look at anything else. Other than our wife, if you will see her as the most beautiful creature that God has ever created, you'll treat her like that. But if you start compromising your eyes with other, other women who are, who are not appropriately dressed, or if you get into pornography or anything like that, you cheapen and destroy the relationship you have with your wife. Imagine just for a moment. Bear in mind, we are to, remember I said, our responsibility is her self-image and how she, she sees herself. What if she, and don't think for a moment that she doesn't know, but what if she saw you do that? What if she sees or hears of you doing that? What does that do to her self-image? It completely obliterates it and destroys it. Because she will therefore compare herself to the ones that you're looking at. And that's not, that should not ever cross her mind. She should see herself as being beyond compare. And that you have no one else to look at because that's all, I mean, she's all that God has for you. And that's all that you really need. And you would be satisfied in her. If you can do that, if you can do that, you will cherish your wife. And I want to encourage you to do this, to sanctify your eyes, that you only have eyes for her. Ima um, you know, it's, it's a funny thing about our bodies. Remember, he's making the comparison about how that we ought to nourish and, and to cherish our bodies in the same way. I mean, he's drawing all that parallel 
and, and bringing it into the relationship of marriage. But it's so funny how that we take for granted when we're healthy our body parts, don't we? Everything from hands, eyes that can see, ears that can hear, everything we take for granted. But the moment we get sick, the moment we inflict injury upon our, our hand or anywhere else, what immediately happens? We immediately give attention to it, don't we? We immediately, you don't think about the rest of the body, you think about the cut that you have on your finger. And that's exactly what happens when we injure our wives. Guys, it's going to happen. We're going to put our foot in, the mouth, in our mouths a lot and, and pray that God gives you a forgiving wife. But understand that the moment we do injury to ourselves, we need to do it the same way in cherishing our bodies and how that we would immediately seek medication, we would immediately seek to, to heal that wound, we need to immediately seek to heal any injury that we may cause to our wife. We need to cherish her just the same way you cherish your body. And so, what did we look at? We looked at um, is that we, we, uh, we ought to love our wives, and that love is a sacrificial love. And then we looked at how that we need to nourish our wives' perception, of that relational, um, that relational um, appetite that she has. And then we looked at how that we ought to cherish and how that we are to hold her in high regard and esteem her as valuable. But I want us to, I want us to have, a, um, as we come to our conclusion, guys, there is a cycle that I want, want us to be aware of. Um, there is a um, there's a book that I would recommend that you read. It's Dr. Emerson's book. It's uh, called Love and Respect. And in that book, he talks about a cycle, and he's calling it the crazy cycle. Now, that's not a setting on your washing machine. That's not a, a state of when you think that she's gone crazy. Okay? What the crazy cycle is this, Okay? You men, we all, we've all looked at how that we ought to love our wives, right? But let's say for a moment we get in our minds that they do not deserve our love because she has not respected me. She cuts me down. She criticizes me. And so I will withhold the love that's due to her. Now, what's going to happen, and this is the crazy cycle, is she will perceive and see that you're not, you're not giving her the love and affection that she needs. And what will she do? She'll, therefore, withhold the respect that you need, the affirmation that you need. And you see how it becomes a deadly cycle? And that's what it's a crazy cycle. It spins everything out of control. And what I would encourage you guys to do is called the energizing cycle. But he, he pulls out in this book. If you will continually give the love that your wife needs, don't think about whether she deserves it or not. How many of us deserve the love of God? We're looking at that as an example, remember, of how Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Did, he, did we deserve it? No. Don't look and see whether or not you deserve it or she deserves it. If you will give it to her, she will perceive the love and the affection that you give her, and in turn, she will give you the respect that you, you need. And you see how before long it becomes a cycle that is a self-propelling cycle of good things, you love her, she respects you. You love her, you, she respects you. And how it just keeps on going. And that's the indication of a good and a healthy marriage. But I would... I, guys, this is so important. I want us to have good and healthy marriages. But guys, as you've learned, as, as we've done the men's breakfast, you've known, and I've, I've harped on it, that our, our disposition is to be passive, isn't it? Just to be laid back and just let the cards fall where they lay and not to be an aggressor, not to take the, on the responsibility that we ought to. And so, guys, can I issue the charge? Love your wife. Do everything in your power. Sacrifice for her. Cherish her. Nourish her. I want you to express your love toward her in some form, some way, and I don't want you to wait till Valentine's Day to do it. You know what she likes. You know what she desires. Why not give it to her? 
You say, well, I don't know. Well, maybe you need to re you need to recommunicate or reconnect and communicate your desires. Young people, this is what marriage looks like. This is what it ought to look like. And I would I would encourage you to look for someone who will do that, to be that for you. And not to satisfy your needs, but see someone that you can satisfy their needs with. Does that make sense? That you look for, not for the things that you want. I'm looking for somebody who will respect me. Yeah, you need to, but you need to look for someone you ought to love. And, and, and I want to just say this, like I said, in closing. What, is, what does this all look like? And, and young people, y'all, you'll, you'll understand this. And, and those of us who have been married for some time, you'll understand this. Tommy Nelson gives a wonderful illustration about what it looks like to be married. And he calls it and, re- and refers to it as a race. And in this race, you're running at a certain pace. Spiritually, you are running at a, a certain pace in your life. And you're going to have people that pass you. They're far more spiritual than you are. That's okay. You may pass people. What marriage looks like is this. To not be unequally yoked, you look around and you see someone who's running the exact same pace and running in the exact same direction. You're running towards Christ. That's the goal. And what marriage looks like is this. You look over at her and say, do you want to run this race together? And you lock arms and you run the race together. That's what a godly marriage ought to be like. Why is that so important? Can two walk together except they be agreed? The scripture, time and time and time again, tells you to not be unequally yoked. You know, except in Christ, you know, we try to make it possibly much more complicated than what it really has to be. A lot of times, it's just like a marriage. Accepting Christ is just like a marriage. You know, have you, you've been to enough weddings to know that there's someone, a minister that stands before, right? There's a groom, there's a bride, and God willing, there's a father that walks the bride down the aisle. You have the whole trinity there. God the Father walks you to the aisle, to Christ, doesn't he? Christ is the groom, and the Holy Spirit is conducting the ceremony. You have, you have the whole trinity right here right now, and just like in a wedding, and we, we have this invitation, and we encourage you to walk the aisle and to put your faith and trust in Christ if you've never done so, and what does that look like? It's just the same thing as marriage vows. Holy Spirit looks, says, Jesus, do you take this person to love, to cherish for all eternity? He says, I do. He purchased us. But what do you do? when you are turned and the Holy Spirit looks to you and says, will you take Christ to love, to cherish from now to all eternity? That's what it is. And if you'll say, yes, I do, put your faith and trust in Him for His faithfulness and love towards us, and they died for us. Scripture says you, pay, you pass from death to life, that you become in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here and you want to be the husband that you, God has called you to be, but you cannot if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You have to have that spiritual awakening in Him. He, he, he rebirths in you a new life. You're, not, you're no longer yourself anymore. He comes and He abides within us and He causes us to walk and become the husband that He wants us to be. And I would encourage you, if you never put your faith and trust in Him, I would encourage you to do so today. And maybe you're here and you've, You've not joined a local church and you want to get to work with what God's doing here in Stuttgart, Arkansas with Park Avenue Baptist Church, we would encourage you to come and make that, uh, make that public. Maybe you're here and you've never been baptized and you have not followed the Lord in scriptural baptism. Listen, that is a commandment of scripture that we ought to follow. Jesus, whenever he went down to be baptized, did you not realize that he walked over 35 miles to be baptized? You didn't have to go that far, did you? In fact, you don't have to go that far at all. And if it was important to him, don't you think that if he commanded you to do the same, it ought to be important to you? 
whatever God has for you, I'm going to ask that you stand. We're going to have our musicians come. We're going to have a moment of invitation. Whatever he has for you, whatever his will may be, maybe you need to come and, and men, take your wife by the hand and, and pray with her at this altar and, and pray that, she, that you would become the husband that you ought to be. Maybe you need to put your faith and trust in him, but whatever it may be, I want you to have full freedom here. The Spirit will make you free and that he will call you in whatever capacity he would have you to be, whether, whether up here at the altar, whether right there with your spouse, whether you need to put your faith and trust in him, whatever it may be, I pray that you'd let him have his way as we sing.